Uh, obviously, what you're really getting when you pledge to KPFA is this radio station, not not a thank you gift. Um, you know, if anyone would have sort of understood that concept, it probably would have been Mark's. Uh, KPFA is a commons. These are public airwaves. And for us to exist, uh, we need to have listeners sustain us. We reject the model of commercial underwriting and corporate sponsorship. Uh, the founders of KPFA more than 75 years ago came up with this other model, and uh, it is a, an inspiring model. It's amazing that it has continued, but it does mean that Fund Drive to Fund Drive, we do have to go to you and ask for your support. Um, so I strongly urge you to join uh, this, this effort uh, that is... KPFA, this incredible project, um, and support us right now. KPFA.org, 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA, because given that we do not have to worry about corporations telling us not to discuss anti-capitalist ideas on these airwaves, we don't, in effect, have any kind of blacklist of the ideas that we are able to bring to you. Um, and that is partially because no one is breathing down our necks, um, vetting what we do, who we have on, telling us that we can't do certain subjects and certain things are off limits. But it's also because this radio station is um, has the, the absolute, I would say, privilege, except that it's not something that should be special, of the long form, that we are able to explore ideas in depth on this radio station that we're not uh, creating sound bites around commercials, which is really the, the model for most of the media. Um, the commercials are the real thing and then short segments of programming are put around it. We don't do that here on KPFA. Uh, if that is something that you value, then I ask you to support us right now. 1-800-439-5732. That's one 800 Hey KPFA, kpfa.org. And of course, when you're donating to KPFA, you are not donating for a private service. You are donating for a public commons. You are sustaining it. You're doing it for yourself, of course. You're also doing it for your, for your fellow listeners. And you're doing it for that person who hasn't discovered KPFA. But by you pledging, you're keeping this radio station going into the coming months and years, just the same way that previous listeners have done that for you, that you were able to find KPFA because listeners before you kept this radio station going. It is a, a crucial time to support us right now because we have a substantial amount of ground to make up. I want to go back to more from this interview, but I do want to ask uh, several more of you to go to kpfa.org or call 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. We have all sorts of thank you gifts on offer. Um, we have a calendar that has proved very popular of moments in KPFA history and people from KPFA's history uh, that can be yours for a pledge of $100 a month, the 2025 wall calendar, the KPFA election night watch party, Tuesday, November 5th, 7 to 10 p.m. Uh, it's going to feature Kat Brooks and Dennis Bernstein and Davey D and Mitch Jesuit, Mitch Jesuit and Brian Edwards, Edwards Teekert. Um, that is yours for one single ticket for $120, although you can get more than one. Honestly, really, though, what this comes down to is having this radio station here for you. And if that is something that's important to you, I ask you to support us right now. 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA, kpfa.org. We're going to go back to more from this interview that I did with the co-editors of a new translation of Marxist Capital, Paul North and Paul Ryder. But I want to urge you, encourage you, um, as we're playing this, to donate because every minute really does count here from now till 7 p.m. kpfa.org, 1-800-439-5732. Paul Ryder, Capital is obviously not just one of the most important political texts, but it's also regarded as a major literary work. 
And I wanted to ask you how you would characterize the literary style of Capital. Yours is the fourth translation into English of Capital. And and whether you feel like that style comes through in the other translations, because I would imagine that given the political stakes for many of the people translating Marx, often the emphasis would be on getting sort of fealty to the the sentiment, the political sentiment, not necessarily to whatever sort of stylistic flourish that Marx was making. So the first translation, which was overseen by Engels, caused Engels a lot of pain. Engels was very much a purist in matters of Marx translation, and he complained a lot over the years about the inadequacies of Marx translations. And he complained somewhat bitterly to Marx, who was involved in the French translation of Capital, that Marx himself suggested had simplifying tendencies about these tendencies. But then, when it came time for him to oversee the first English translation of Capital, he really does seem to have gone against some of his own translation principles and focused on a translation that didn't ask too much of readers, that in a way pulls back on the strangeness of the text. A lot of these neologisms that we were just talking about, terms that are strange in German, like Gegenständlichkeit or Wertgegenständlichkeit, these are translated in that first translation, again overseen by Engels, as very everyday words, like as value, for example. And um, Oh, you have to keep in mind the first translations, they have particular pressures. Marx was not very well known in 1887 when the first English translation came out. And uh, so you didn't have a base of motivated readers as you have today, where people think, okay, this is going to be difficult, we know, but it's a classic, it's worth it, it's an important book, so we're going to steal ourselves for this, di- for this difficulty. Engels had to worry about people giving up pretty quickly. Um, And so that is a translation that does prioritize a certain kind of of, of readability, I would say, a a readability that is one through making the text less less strange than it is in uh, in English. The second translation, um, its goal was to be even more accessible than the first translation. This was done in 1928, after the Russian Revolution. The idea was that, well, Marx, his ideas are so important now in the world, we should have an even more accessible translation. That was the goal there. That translation didn't really go anywhere. It was criticized quite harshly by the most important scholar of Marx at the time, a person named David Ryazanov, and uh, it never really recovered from, from, from that judgment. The Fawkes translation from 1976 is interesting. Fawkes complains about, he doesn't mention the second translation by Eden and Cedar Paul. He just talks in his preface about the Samuel Moore, Edward Aveling, original 1887 translation. And he says that it prioritized accessibility above all else, and it watered down Marx's philosophical terminology, but it also failed to preserve the literary qualities of Marx's language. And his goal then, clearly, is to do better on on both fronts. Does he do that? Um, Well, in some ways, it's a more technical-sounding translation. Um, He does go farther in preserving Marx's neologistic conceptual vocabulary than more Aveling do, but not as far as you might expect. In fact, he follows them in, in quite a few places um, and gives paraphrases rather than uh, individual terms for some of Marx's neologistic concepts around value. He also follows them quite a bit elsewhere, too. And so his translation is not quite as different from theirs as he perhaps makes it out to be, Um, although it is, generally speaking, a more technical-sounding translation that does do a lot of noun-to-noun translating, which is not, it has its, that has its advantages, it's a way of conveying something about the structure of the German, but it's not the best way to preserve some of what I understand to be qualities of the work. Um, Rhythm, cadence, these things were very important to Marx. 
um, the shifts in register, moving from technical discussions to, uh, to jokes. Marx also uses very sophisticated mimetic techniques in this book, which is something that I only really came to appreciate when I uh, was doing this translation. Um, he imitates people from the third person so that he can comment on what they're saying, what he's having them say, capitalists, political economists, um, without interrupting their monologue. And I think it works really well, and it's not something that I've seen a lot of. And uh, I would say that this is a very sophisticated literary device. Also, the way he quotes um, is there, there's definitely an artistry to that. Um, not only literary quotations, where he kind of reworks the quotations creatively to fit his purposes. He was someone who had a very intimate knowledge of high culture and a great deal of respect for high culture, but not a reverential attitude toward it. He didn't mind getting in there and changing around quotations by Goethe, um, for example, to fit his purposes, but also the way he arranges quotations from factory inspectors' reports, um, it's really uh, a very impressive thing that he that he does. I'm speaking with Paul Ryder and Paul North. Together they are co-editors of a new edition and translation of Marx's Capital, the first volume which Paul Ryder translated. I'm Sasha Lilly, and this is Against the Grain on Pacifica Radio. Well, staying for a moment more with the particulars of the translation, Obviously, for people on the left, what Marx actually meant is an area of debate and discussion. And one area that has, in recent decades, been considered again is around the notion of the kind of bloody dispossession that Paul uh, North mentioned earlier, which had been translated as primitive accumulation, the process of enclosing land, dispossessing people who are then forced to become waged workers, that this is a crucial process in the history of capitalism. And there are those like David Harvey, who would argue, or the people in the Midnight Notes Collective, Peter Leinbaugh and Sylvia Federici, that this is a process that doesn't just happen at the dawn of capitalism, but happens again and again. And hence, the way these things are conceived of has some relevance to such debates. And I, I wanted to ask you about that term, primitive accumulation, which I think raises the hackles of a lot of people. Just the term primitive is obviously very uneasy terminology in the first place, but how you handled that translation and whatever challenges it posed. These are complicated issues. And I would just say that um, what's being fought over there is um, capitals outside. It's very hard to even understand your own experience when you're living in a capital system. What are your motivations? Are, there your own, are they your own psychological motivations, your private motivations, or are they given to you through advertising or given to you through the form of employment that you have? It's hard to understand it from there, but people are constantly looking where the outside is. And Marx made the argument that capital absorbs its outside in violent ways. That's, that happens in a number of ways. It happens in reproductive labor, people who are doing labor in the home, for example, traditionally women, but now often immigrants, who don't get recompense. Capital uses it, but in a sense is... Um, extracting it without uh, being involved in the capital process of having to pay a wage. And so there's many, many places in which capital is absorbing its outside in ways that are not uh, recompensed. And in fact, the first person who took issue with the idea that original accumulation in German, ursprüngliche Akkumulation, was... Um, still going on under capital, it didn't just precede capital, was Rosa Luxemburg, a great theorist from the early 20th century, a great reader of Marx, a critic of Marx. And Federici and that group is really in the, in the inheritance of Rosa Luxemburg. 
why should we call it original accumulation rather than primitive accumulation? Well, primitive has all those connotations of being naive, of being developmentally backwards, of being simple in some way. And this form of accumulation is none of those things. When uh, land was appropriated for capitalist use without recompense by sovereigns, and the workers on it, the peasants on it, were dispossessed, kicked out, and they had to go become wage workers. This was not simple. It also was developmentally exactly where it needed to be in history. So primitive is just wrong, and most readers understand that that has too many bad implications. Original is also wrong, and Marx uses it in quotation marks or with the term so-called in front of it, because in fact, original is the way the political economists call it. In fact, it's not original, it's ongoing and forever that capital will be absorbing its outside and violent ways. So the irony, when you translate it as original, the irony comes back when you strip off those false associations of primitive, you get the irony back, which is, well, it's not fully capitalist, but capitalism uses those not fully capitalist ways of accumulating things continuously. Why is it that you decided, both of you decided, to base this new edition and this new translation that Paul Ryder did on the second German edition of Capital that Marx published? So the first thing to understand is that Marx was writing continually. In fact, an argument has been made that this version of Volume 1 of Capital is 172nd of all the manuscripts he produced for the Capital Project. That's not including his earlier writings. So um, it's a little falsifying to choose a text and just present it because he changed his mind, he revised, he kept making notes for revisions on important concepts and then also revisions that had to do with how those concepts were presented so that the people he wanted to read this, who were the workers, could have the most access to it. So he was constantly revising. And for that reason, there's a number of versions. The second German edition, which came out in 1872, uh, is the most trustworthy. It is its own edition. It's the most trustworthy in one sense because Marx saw it through to publication. Every change in it was his. And that is Paul North, a co-editor of a new translation of Marx's Capital. I'm Sasha Lilly. This is a special fund drive programming in the waning hours of KPFA's fall fund drive. The drive ends at 7 p.m. tonight, and we have a lot of uh, money that we do need to make in that time uh, before 7 o'clock rolls around, $83,260 to be precise. And I'm hoping to raise as much as I can uh, in the next 10 minutes before the hour is up with your help. Um, kpfa.org, 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. A pledge of $23 a more or month or $230 in one go will get you, uh, if you would like it, um, Marx's Capital. It is 944 pages long with extensive commentary, including a foreword by political theorist Wendy Brown and introductions by Paul North and Paul Ryder, the translator who we've just been hearing from, as well as an afterward by William Clare Roberts, who we have interviewed on these airwaves about Marx and freedom. Uh, it is just one of many thank you gifts, of course, that you can get. Uh, what you really get is the sustenance of this Commons of the Airwaves KPFA, kpfa.org, 1-800-439-5732. As I mentioned, uh, we have just a few hours left before seven and this fun drive ends come what may. Uh, we need to raise as much money as possible uh, in the next four hours and 10 minutes, four hours and nine minutes to do that. Uh, and I, I'm hoping I can encourage you right now to join 
listeners who have pledged in this hour. I want to thank an anonymous donor in Los Altos Hill who chose to subscribe uh, on the monthly sustainer plan. Um, that is, uh, you contribute a certain amount each month. It's very easy to set up as a way of sustaining KPFA. They write, thank you to everyone at KPFA doing what you do to share local stories, to tell unfiltered truth about international stories and build community. Thank you to that uh, donor. I also want to thank um, D. Bruce uh, in Walnut Creek. Thank you so much for your pledge of support. An anonymous donor in Bodega, thank you very much. An anonymous donor in Fremont, I thank you as well. And I'm hoping I'm saying this right, Octave in Oakland. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, we need you to join them, kpfa.org, 1-800-439-5732. There's eight minutes left before the hour is up. And a donor in Silver Springs, who prefers not to say their name, has put up a challenge to their fellow, <clears throat> fellow listeners of $500. Uh, they will match you dollar for dollar, but it is conditional. It has to be before the hour is up. So... There is no better time to call and pledge than right now when your dollars are doubled. kpfa.org, 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Please support KPFA uh, in our hour of need. Um, just consider what uh, is happening around us. Um, Hurricane Helene has killed already dozens of people. Um, in Florida and in the South. Uh, Israel is, has uh, launched a, a horrendous, appalling attack um, on Lebanon, um, widening the violence that it has been committing in Palestine, in Gaza and the West Bank. We know that the times ahead of us are going to be tumultuous and difficult. The times right now are tumultuous and difficult. We need KPFA to be as strong as possible going into the months ahead. KPFA.org, 1-800-439-5732. If you agree with that, then I hope you'll give as generously as you can. Uh, we often talk here on KPFA about our collective capacities to change the world for the better, which is an antidote for the isolation a lot of people feel politically and the political situation we're in. KPFA has historically been a space for not just understanding the world or analyzing the world, but changing the world. And KPFA needs to continue as strong as possible to have those crucial discussions and debates that we need in the coming months um, in these terrible times that we're living through, we need KPFA to be here and to be as strong as possible. KPFA.org, 1-800-439-5732. $500 is on the line right now. We have one caller on the line so far. We haven't made anything toward that match, although I know we can make this challenge uh, with your help. So I'm asking you to step forward right now in the waning hours of KPFA's fun drive, in the waning minutes of this hour when I come to you here on KPFA, kpfa.org or 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA. We've got five minutes left to make this $500 match. And honestly, we cannot afford at this point to offer the money back to the donor in Silver Springs, given the shortfall that we are potentially facing with our budget if we are not able to make up uh, $83,000 in the coming hours. So I'm asking you to do whatever you can and to think about the listeners who have come before you um, and kept this radio station alive during previous dark times, such as during the McCarthy era, uh, which was a very difficult time for this radio station, through the civil rights movement, the movements of the 1960s and 70s, through Iran-Contra and the first and second Gulf Wars, the occupation of Afghanistan, all the proxy wars that have followed, the terrible violence that an, a U.S. proxy is um, uh, exacting um, in Palestine and Lebanon. 
Be here for us right now. Be here for your fellow listeners and future listeners by keeping this radio station going. KPFA.org, 1-800-439-5732. I want to thank James in San Francisco for your pledge of support. We now need $400 to make this match, and now we have three minutes to do so. Please step forward for us because your dollars are doubled right now. KPFA.org, one 800 Four three nine five seven three two one eight hundred. Hey KPFA. I have to say that it is an incredible privilege to be able to broadcast on these airwaves uh, because of our listeners who have been generation upon generation the most engaged and generous people stepping forward for KPFA. I'm so grateful to all of you who have pledged. If you are able to pledge right now. Uh, It would be so absolutely appreciated. Your dollars are doubled uh, and very little time to go. We have about two and a half minutes to do it. Uh, So far, $400 on the line. Won't you join the listeners who've pledged so far? KPFA.org, 1-800-439-5732. Your donation, of course, is tax deductible to the fullest extent allowed by law. We are living through such... Um, violent and and terrible times. And I hope um, that you understand that when you support KPFA, a, a radio station like KPFA is able to be here because we do not take money from those who profit from the climate emergency. We do not take money from those who profit from war and the military. We're not taking money from weapons companies. We are taking money from you. We are um, uh, funded by you when you choose to fund us. kpfa.org, 1-800-439-5732. We have less than two minutes to go before the hour is up. We absolutely need to make this challenge put up by this donor in Silver Springs. Won't you help? Won't you join uh, KPFA right now? Because I'd say giving your money to KPFA, and I realize that, you know, your money is hard earned. But when you do support KPFA, there is something tremendous about the the knowledge that you are joining forces with your fellow listeners to keep this radio station going. It's it's going because of you. It is because of you that we are here. And that is a tremendous feeling. I think it's a feeling that is empowering when it's so easy to feel disempowered and isolated. KPFA breaks through that isolation. But we need to step forward, all of us together, at a time like this. kpfa.org, 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA. We've got 60 seconds to go. To make this match, please uh, call right now. Join those who are on the line because I think we need two more calls to be able to make this challenge. I want to thank... The anonymous donor who uh, pledged in Berkeley, thank you so much for that generous pledge. Uh, Please join that listener because we have so much ground to make uh, before 7 o'clock today. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. KPFA.org. Do it for yourself. Do it for your larger community. Do it for those who haven't yet discovered KPFA, but thanks to your efforts are going to do so, so that we can be here in the coming months. Uh, Thanks to your efforts, you did it. You joined in and allowed that to happen. Thank you, Adam in Redwood City. Uh, Thank you to those of you who are there for us. Uh, Looks like we are out of time. We've made the match. Thank you so much, so much more to raise though. So please keep calling and pledging. I'm so grateful to all of you. Robert Reich. I used to be Bill Clinton's Secretary of Labor. I'm now a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. I want to urge everyone who is listening to contribute to KPFA. In these difficult times, I cannot imagine living in a world without KPFA. KPFA's unique approach, insights, social criticism, uh, vitally, vitally important. And we all have, it seems to me, a very strong obligation to make sure that KPFA survives and even thrives. So please, make a contribution. Make it now. 
and keep KPFA going. Thank you. Donate today at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org.